The following nature walk was filmed on land that was traditionally used for thousands of years by Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. There are still many issues surrounding the relationship of these indigenous people who are still alive in the country of Canada with the land, including the national and provincial parks in Canada. While these issues are complicated and beyond the scope of this video, they must not be ignored by us who have the privilege of enjoying these spaces. We are all treaty people. Hey friends, a quick note as we're getting started. Algonquin Provincial Park is a place that was formative in my years of learning about and experiencing nature. And at the time of this video, it had been the better part of 20 years since I first went there. Uh, and this is the first time I was able to experience this with my wife. So I might be a little bit excited. Enjoy. Good morning. I and my fantastic, wonderful assistant, slash best friend life partner, wifey, are on our way to Algonquin Provincial Park. I'm excited! For a very special nature walk with Gabe. Algonquin! Yay! Hi. Algonquin Provincial Park is enormous. At 7,600 kilometers squared, it's bigger than the entire province of Prince Edward Island. And oh boy, oh boy, we're crossing! 24 kilometers! We made it to Algonquin. Look at that. Oh, beautiful. Oh, wow. We're in Algonquin. We only had one day to enjoy this park together and we wanted to make the very most of it. So we decided to begin by driving right across the park eastwards to the visitor center. It should be noted that not only is stopping on the side of provincial highways like Highway 60 that goes through the southwestern portion of Algonquin Park potentially very dangerous, but it can actually be illegal. So thankfully Algonquin has many small off roads and parking lots where if you've purchased a park pass, which we did, you can stop there much more safely to take in the scenery and observe wildlife. That being said, it is a well-known fact that people do regularly stop along Highway 60 pretty much anywhere they see wildlife. And in the summer months, where you see cars pulled over to the side of the road, likely there's some interesting wildlife to be seen there as well. Nice cow moose, no antlers, but big, big adult. She was a big one. That was really cool. Even though Highway 60, which runs through the south part of the park, is a major road, it is basically the only major road in all of Algonquin Park, meaning it's not very hard to get away from most of the major sounds of human activity, at least outside of the busiest season of the summer into the early fall. But if you live in this city or even just near a busy road, one of the best gifts Algonquin Park can provide to you is easy access to true wilderness. Our visit was in late October of 2021, and this was the atmosphere on the observation platform just behind the visitor center when we arrived that morning. from the beautiful vistas behind me, Ontario's largest provincial park up here on the Canadian Shield. You can see uh, just the incredible, beautiful, huge, epic space. It's amazing if you are the kind of person that's only ever lived in the city to just be up here 
for nothing else but the silence. It's very easy to hear the birds from up here, but it's funny because uh, it's hard to find them because it's so open and it's so quiet up here. It's really hard to identify where the sound is coming from. <laughs> We're really high up. Um, uh, Algonquin Park is also Canada's oldest park. Uh, it was opened in the 1890s. We are super excited to be here. There, lovely look. What is it? That's an evening grow speak. That was my first ever sighting of an evening grow speak. While very cool, these birds were also very shy. These purple finches here were somewhat more obliging, though still sticking to the very tops of the trees where they can find most of their diet. These finches, like many finches, primarily feed on seeds and fruit, though they will eat insects as well for extra protein. And I know what you're thinking, and you're right, they're not really purple. Many of the birds we saw this day were as shy as that moose we saw on the way in. For example, this rough grouse. Oh, Lily! The pine siskins that you can hear here, but we never saw. A few of the birds were somewhat more obliging, like the bald eagle that stored overhead for a while, or these double-crested cormorants we saw fishing at Lake Opiongo. One species in particular actually pursued Hi. us as we went <laughs> through the park. No, I'm scared. These birds are, of course, black-capped chickadees, one of my all-time favorites and a bird that's very comfortable in habitats both further north and further south than Algonquin Park. Black-capped chickadees are some of the most curious and brave birds in North America. They, more than any other species of wild bird that I know, can consistently be trained Hi. to take food out of someone's hand. It was clear to us that the chickadees here had regularly received food from people. Just holding out an empty hand or even walking through the woods was enough to bring them crowding around us. And now the others come. <laughs> oh, is there food here? Are, are you sure there's oh not food gosh, here? I know. And people stop that means there's food Are you sure? These little songbirds are year-round residents here in Ontario, and they're able to survive through the cold winters because they store seeds, nuts, and other foods away, hiding them in crevices or holes throughout their home territory. This act of hiding food away for later is called caching, and chickadees have an incredible memory for it, remembering thousands of separate locations of their small caches. They're incredible little survivors. Now feeding a wild animal from your hand is an incredible experience, but it should never be done thoughtlessly. We've been to many conservation areas across Ontario where feeding birds from your hand with small nuts or bird seed is allowed. And I love doing this. However, there are risks associated with it, especially for the birds. Research is still being performed as to how receiving extra food from humans affects different species and populations, but regardless of that impact, we know for sure that feeding animals makes them more comfortable around people. And in the most visited provincial park in Ontario, Algonquin, you can bet that not everyone who gets close to a small animal is going to have the same respect for that animal and its welfare. So making birds comfortable with people puts them at risk of being harmed by these people or other human activities. Also, while it is rare, diseases can be passed between birds and humans, so that presents a risk on both sides. For reasons such as these, and their desire to minimize the impact of human visitors on the park and its wildlife, the Ontario Ministry of the Environment has made it illegal to feed any wild animal in any provincial park in Ontario. And if you're caught by park authorities feeding or even leaving food for wildlife, the standard fine you'll be facing is $365. Now, obviously, this hasn't stopped everyone from doing so. Those chickadees are so bold, almost definitely because they've been fed by people. And they're definitely not the only species in the park that's true of. However, my position and my recommendation is to obey all the rules of whatever park you get to visit. Mammals are even riskier to feed than birds. Unlike a chickadee's tiny and relatively weak beak, a squirrel's sharp teeth could easily break human skin leaving the potential for injury or passing disease back and forth much higher. And for this reason, I never hand feed mammals anywhere I go. But you don't have to feed them for these little red squirrels here in Algonquin to come very close to you. <laughs> it's okay, buddy. No. No, no, no. 
just fearless. Absolutely fearless. <laughs> I can't believe you, little one. You're very cute. But no, no, still no. Are you sure though? You will start biting people. You will. So up here in the boreal forest, or in places like this that are dominated by coniferous trees, evergreen trees, you have a lot of American red squirrels, but you don't tend to have very many gray squirrels, the squirrels we're really used to in southern Ontario. American red squirrels are, on average, a whole tail's length smaller than the eastern gray squirrel, although their attitude is much bigger. These are one of the most territorial creatures I've ever experienced in the world, and they're tremendously vocal towards anyone who dares to enter their territory uninvited, no matter how big or small that entity might be. It sounds like two fighting. It does. But it's just one. It's just one being a great huge grump. Through most of the year, if you spend a day in Algonquin Park, you're almost guaranteed to get verbally chewed out by a red squirrel at some point just as these pine cones here are literally chewed out by them. Like the black-capped chickadees, American red squirrels will cache food away for the winter. Unlike the chickadees, they often will only have a few locations where they store food in big stockpiles. And the squirrels who make these will come back to them every day throughout the winter months to help them survive. Getting the tiny seeds out of pine or spruce cones creates quite a bit of waste. And you can always tell when there's been a red squirrel around by things like that, a nice pile of pine cones uh, scales. These piles of discarded scales and cores of coniferous cones are called middens. And these can be meters across and are classic indicators of a healthy red squirrel population in an area. So yeah, you look for pine cone scales like that, there's probably a red squirrel around. <laughs> they'll be busy throughout the whole year, but they'll store pine cones away. So you'll sometimes see them up at the tops of the trees snipping off a bunch of uh, cones in a row. I say pine cones, they could be cones from other trees too. Provincial parks are full of natural habitat for the species that are here. So please, even though it can be really tempting, don't feed the animals when you're at a provincial park. Much of Algonquin Park's beauty can be experienced right along the roadside, but you only see a fraction of all it has to offer if you never leave the highway. Thankfully, there are hundreds of trails across the park, and 20 of them include educational signs or guidebooks at the trailheads, which are just off of Highway 60. Come to Algonquin, they gave you free trail maps on each trail. Hooray! We chose to walk the Spruce Boardwalk Trail on this day, which is quite close to the visitor center. It's one of the most popular trails in the whole park because it's so short. It's only about one and a half kilometers. This was the location we were most pursued by the chickadees and red squirrels that we've already discussed. We started off the walk very well with a great big common raven being just on the edge of the parking lot. Common ravens are more abundant as you go north in Ontario, but they occupy a wide range of habitats across the northern hemisphere of the entire world. I'm sure you've noticed that this common raven looks very similar to a crow, and you're not wrong. Crows and ravens are very similar in appearance and in many of their behaviors. They're also very closely related. The best way to actually tell them apart is by size. Ravens are much bigger than crows. Also, they're slightly different in shape. Ravens have bills that are bigger for their size than crows do. Common ravens tend to have throat feathers that stick out a bit, making them look a bit shaggy. And their tails are more wedge-shaped. They come out in the middle. While American crows have tails with fairly flat back edges to them. Both crows and ravens make a wide variety of calls and sounds. But crows tend to make more of a sound, your typical caw, while ravens make more of a throaty sound. Both of these birds are highly intelligent omnivores with few natural enemies as adults and are real success stories in the bird world. Now, back to the bog. In case you don't know, bogs are a particular kind of wetland habitat. You're probably familiar with swamps and marshes, which are the most common kinds of wetlands we think of in southern Ontario. Bogs are different from these in that they have almost no moving water, and they're characterized by a thick layer of peat on the ground or at the water surface. Peat is basically compost. It's small dead plants, particularly mosses like sphagnum moss and sedges, that are slowly breaking down like normal, but then the bog stops them from becoming soil. Peat forms when these dead plants are submerged in water, and because the water isn't moving, the oxygen which helps tiny creatures break down the plants doesn't circulate. 
It can't get to the plants very well. So instead of becoming soil, the plants get stuck in this in-between, dark, compact, stuck together and somewhat crumbly mat form that slowly leaks the chemical parts of the plant into the water. The chemicals build up over time and totally change the chemistry of the water and soil around them, making the whole area more acidic. This is another key feature of bogs. They're full of acids. Peat can develop in many different kinds of wetlands, so if water flow is somehow stopped and the right plants start growing there, other wetlands will become bogs over time. Bogs can also be extremely dangerous places for people to walk. In a bog, what looks like solid ground is often just compressed mats of decaying peat with very muddy and possibly very deep water underneath. If you step in this, you'll likely sink through and you won't have anything to push off of from underneath you. And without anything solid enough, including bog plants to use to pull yourself out, you could be in serious trouble. So especially on a trail with a bog, but honestly on every trail you visit, please stay on the path. Bogs are also a place you tend to find special plants that you won't find in neighboring habitats. The thickness of the peat and the alterations it makes to the environment with increasing acid and lowering oxygen means that most plants can't grow there unless they're very special. This bog Labrador tea is one example of such a specialized plant. And as its name suggests, it is used by some First Nations and other people in hot drinks. Another species that grows well along the edge of the bog is the tamarack. Tamaracks are a kind of larch. Larches are coniferous trees or trees with needles that aren't evergreens. In the fall, their needles change color from green to gold, and eventually they even fall off. In this part of the world, tamaracks are the only trees that do this, so they're pretty easy to identify in the fall. Tamaracks add beautiful gold color to the forests of Canada's more boreal regions after the trees with more typical leaves have already dropped theirs. Most trees with needles instead of leaves keep these needles year to year. But by dropping their needles, tamaracks can pull some of their valuable resources back into their trunk for the winter, meaning they're safer from snow damage through the winter and are more resistant to insect attacks and fire through the rest of the year. Tamaracks are tough trees. Their special relationship with different kinds of fungi helps them to survive in a variety of different habitats, including bogs. However, as bogs become boggier over time, usually the tamaracks will die and are replaced by an even tougher tree, the black spruce. I am a tree. I can grow here too. I will be big and tall and strong. <sighs> In eastern North America, Black spruce are just about the only tree that can grow large in true bog conditions. The tall, thin conifer trees you see here with short needles, short branches, and noticeable gaps between their branches are black spruce. They are so dominant in this landscape that many other species have developed special relationships with them to survive. One of these species is one that we have seen before in our nature walks. As we went along, I noticed this tree. Look at this. It's got little bottle brush type seeds that almost look like a pine cone, but they're not. And these toothed leaves here. Deciduous leaves. So this is an alder. But I'm pretty sure this is not like the European alder that we'd seen in previous episodes. This is a native one. Um, and it probably tells us in the book. But I don't really know. Let's see. What does it say there? there? Speckled alder. The speckled alder is a native one. So there you go, speckled alders, key species, that can grow in the highly acidic soil and waters of a spruce bog. How neat is that? In addition to other plants, one of the animals we were most hoping to see on this day specifically seeks out black spruce for prime habitat. This is a bird with lots of different English names, including Canada Jay, and gray jay, but I like to call them whiskey jacks. I was very excited at the chance to see these birds, and we saw them not once, but twice on this day. First along the road to Lake Opiongo, and once here on the Spruce Bog Boardwalk Trail. The whiskey jack is near the southernmost edge of its range in this part of the continent here in Algonquin Park. Like the black cat chickadees that we also saw in abundance along this trail, whiskey jacks are caching birds. They rely heavily on storing food to get through the winter. 
This is one reason why they love black spruce forests. Black spruce bark has lots of crevices where they can store food. And black spruce trees grow best in places where the temperature is consistently below freezing from the late fall right through to the early spring. This keeps their food from going bad. So it seems Whiskey Jacks never want to live too far away from a potential refrigerator. Whiskey Jacks exceed the chickadees in their intelligence. But like chickadees, they have learned that humans are a consistent source of easy food. And this is also where their name comes from. Multiple First Nations peoples, including the Algonquin people from this region, named the Whiskey Jack after a very intelligent and wise character in their mythologies. Whiskey Jacks regularly followed Algonquin hunters and visited their camps in search of food. Today, they'll follow all sorts of people around hoping for an easy meal. Whiskey Jacks are omnivores. They'll eat a wide variety of foods, including berries and seeds, fungi and carrion, as well as a wide variety of small animals, ranging from gnats and ticks all the way up to smaller birds and their nestlings. And thankfully, their ferocity and intelligence isn't so great that they're a threat for us humans. You've probably noticed the colored bands around the legs of some of these Whiskey Jacks. These are given to the birds by scientists who are researching their populations to help tell individual birds apart. And they're specifically designed so that they won't bother the birds. Seeing Whiskey Jacks was a true highlight of our trip. One last thing that's worth mentioning about box. A relatively smaller number of animals live in a bog habitat compared with other types of wetland habitat. So in the interest of seeing more wildlife, we kept moving. Algonquin Provincial Park is a very ecologically diverse place. This means it has a lot of natural resources, which is why it was protected by people in the first place. The richness of life here is because Algonquin occupies a transition zone here in Ontario between the northern boreal forest and the southern mixed deciduous coniferous and Carolinian forests. So you can see species from both the southern and northern forests in this one area. Representing this well were the birds we encountered on this day. The majority of bird species we saw were along the roadside where seeds and insects become more exposed. Not to mention the potential for roadkill for more carnivorous birds. We saw a nice mix of birds that would likely migrate further south before the season ended on this day. American robins, dark-eyed juncos, white-throated sparrows, and species that would likely spend the winter in or around this area too, like American tree sparrows and this little one. I don't know what this bird is. He blends in really well. Oh, there he is. For identification. What are you, a little beauty? Eating off the ground? Orangey mm -hmm. beak? Mm -hmm. Bit of a finchy no, beak. Finchy beak, but like no sharp markings on the head. It's all kind of this dull, mm -hmm. softly bound coloration. A big brown cheek patch, but then pale mostly on the head, just on the top. I love a little bird. I wasn't able to identify this one until I did some more research after we got home. This is a snow bunting, and it was the first time I'd ever seen one. It was a really good day for birds. The biggest reason I struggled to identify this bird is that through the spring and summer, they are known for being bright white all across their body with black wings. The rusty color and streaks that we're seeing here come in after they shed some feathers through the late summer and fall. Given how small the buntings are, only about 15 centimeters long, it's amazing to me that they would choose to spend their winters in places like central and southern Ontario where we can still get a lot of snow that they'd have to dig under to find food. Though these guys have learned the art of plucking seeds right off the top of forbs and other small plants that are found in meadows and farmers fields. Though the most common place we see these creatures in the winter is locations like this along the roadside where the snow is likely to be less. They often gather in big flocks this way. So it's interesting to me that this one was all alone. For all of the great things we saw on this day, we were really hoping to see some more large mammals, the wildlife Algonquin is best known for. These animals also make a huge impact on their respective habitats, but none more so than the North American beaver. Beavers are more like humans than any other species in Algonquin in that they make their own habitat. Their works are prominent features of numerous waterways across the park. Beaver Dam! You can see how effectively this dam is 
blocked off the level of the lake. Otherwise, the water would be right up at the road level here. But, uh, it's not. Someone's, or probably several someone's have been working hard on it. You can see it's been here long enough that even plants have grown up on it. But it's cool how, yeah, the, the beavers creating habitat by damming up the, the, the lake and the, the river. It floods the whole area behind, which changes the whole landscape. Habitat engineers. If there isn't a habitat they like, they change it so that it will be what they like. Pretty cool. So for clarification, beavers make dams to block the flow of water. Beavers make lodges to live in, though they'll also sometimes just live in burrows they dig in the riverbank if that seems better to them. Beavers aren't just environmentally significant for Algonquin, they're historically significant too. Beaver fur and skin is waterproof and very soft. It was extremely valuable in Europe in times past, and there was a strong motivator for Europeans to explore Ontario, to find animals like beavers to trap and hunt. And historically, the lands that make up Algonquin Park today were booming with beavers. More beavers have been killed for their fur in this area than any other animal, both by colonial hunters and indigenous Algonquin people. But even before the year 1800, Algonquin peoples were already trying to reduce the hunting of European colonizers in the area because the beaver populations were shrinking too fast. This pattern only continued until the 1900s. There is still some hunting of beavers in Algonquin Park today, both by indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. But today, unlike in the past, this hunting is highly regulated. Still, because of numerous factors, the population of beavers in the parklands, once thousands strong, is now below 1,000. Despite all of this, Algonquin Park is still a consistently good place to see beavers. And while we were watching some birds along the road to Lake Opiongo, we got to see this. Yes, this is a North American beaver carrying a whole tree with it. We were both kind of freaking out at this point, but it got even better. I started looking around for the lodge or dam where the beaver might be taking its prize. Little did we know, it had to pass right beside us to get there. Researchers have found that beavers' favorite habitats include two things. The first is their favorite types of food. Beavers eat a wide variety of plants, but their favorites are woody, deciduous, broad-leafed plants that are often found along the edges of woods or rivers. These plants include aspens, birches, poplars, and as you've seen in a previous video, willows. I can't tell exactly what kind of tree this beaver has here, but it certainly fits this broad category. The second thing beavers look for in a home is lots of open water that isn't clogged up with vegetation. Beavers will eat water plants and spend quite a lot of time on land. Their round bodies, short legs, and flat hind feet and tails do make them awkward walkers though. However, they excel at life in the water, turning their weaknesses into strengths. Their tail and hind feet allow them to be powerful swimmers. Human swimmers in the Olympics can swim over 7.5 kilometers an hour, but beavers have been recorded over 10 kilometers an hour. And beavers regularly swim while carrying objects larger than themselves in their mouths. Look at this guy go. You can see here, he's using his hind legs and tail to propel himself forward and steer. And it's keeping a grip on this tree with only its teeth. Beavers have two sets of lips. One is in front of their incisors, the other is between their incisors and the rest of their teeth. This allows them to both hold things while they swim and chew through things underwater without swallowing or choking. 
Of course, most of a beaver's food and building materials are found outside of the water. And scientists have seen that beavers tend to follow a pretty clear strategy known as central foraging theory when they're looking for trees. The general idea is that the further they go from home, the better the stuff they collect needs to be to make it worth the effort. So if they travel a long way from the water's edge to cut down a tree, the tree they look for will usually be a bigger one. You can see the well-worn trail our beaver friend used to go up and down, bringing his trees out from the woods in the back and into the marshland just on the other side over there. Really cool. Of course, it's much easier to transport heavy things in the water than on land. So by building a dam, beavers also make it easier for themselves to move trees around. This time of year in late October is a prime time for seeing beavers. Through most of the year, beavers are most active at night. But as the cold weather starts to set in, they become more active during daylight hours too, trying to gather resources to make their dams and lodges secure. And just like the chickadees, squirrels, and whiskey jacks, to store up food to last them through the winter when their watery homes are covered in ice. Oh. <laughs> so excited. There's a wonderful little beaver behind us. Algonquin has a very special place in my heart because we camped here when I was a kid and we had a fantastic view then of a family of beavers. One with a lodge back there. We just got to watch take almost a whole tree and carry it down and around. And I thought he was going to put it in his lodge. There you can see the lodge. Two lodges. But he put it in his larder. Beavers store up young trees in the, in the fall under the water in a stash that they'll use uh, as a food source during the winter. Ice makes moving around a lot more difficult and dangerous for beavers. So like many animals in this part of the world, they're much less active in the winter spending most of their time inside of their lodges. If they've planned and built well, the main thing they'll leave their lodge for during the winter months is just to grab food from their underwater storage area. We call this a larder, which they'll then bring back up into the lodge to eat. It was amazing to actually get to watch a beaver, a wild beaver at work. So excited. It's incredible that this beaver didn't seem to mind our presence at all. Beavers can be extremely shy, and the beavers of Algonquin Park are definitely used to humans being around, but so long as you aren't chasing them or making noise, and if they're in the water and you're on the land, any beaver will often feel pretty safe to go about its business with you watching them. Though unquestionably, our experience on this day was extremely special. Okay, did you see that? Let's go back and look at that in slow motion because it's worth focusing on. That shake was 0.7 seconds long, but the combination of super waterproof fur and the super fast movement of muscle and skin shook most of the water off of this beaver. Incredible. And then to top it all up, he just sits and eats a snack. Right in front of us. I mean, right in front of us. Look at that. It's incredible. <laughs> the first time I ever saw a wild beaver was here at Algonquin Provincial Park. And it was an absolute joy to be here again with my wife, getting to watch this beaver just doing beaver things. <laughs> what a wonderful experience. We had a fantastic day here in Algonquin Provincial Park. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember to find wonder on your every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you, Lord, for this good day, for your wonderful creation, for your love for us, and good friends to share these things with. Amen.